Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the Alvarez and Marcel Maximizing Foreign Tax Credits by Minimizing Interest Expense Allocation, Electing the Fair Market Value Method. My name is Phil Antoon, and I'll be presenting today with Darren Mills. And I'd first like to go over the webinar agenda. We will go over a few administrative items first. Then Darren and I will introduce ourselves. We'll provide a background on the webinar, talk about the current environment. We'll go through um, some time talking about the election of the fair market value method, some valuation guidance, and the six steps to a fair market value election. I do want to let everyone know that what we're not going to, to do today is provide a tutorial on how to value companies and fixed assets and intangible assets. That's not really what we want to get across here. The goal here is to articulate the current environment for foreign tax credits, why it may be beneficial to make an election, and most importantly, really try to dispel the notion that this can be an overly burdensome process. We'll also talk about required documentation. We will provide a summary with takeaways, and we'll save a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. And if we aren't able to get to all of the questions, we will be more than happy to answer those offline. And if anyone specifically has, for example, valuation questions that are in more detail, we'll be happy to answer those offline as well. Administrative items. The webinar will be one hour in duration. There will be one hour of CP credit provided. We will be asking questions throughout the webinar. For those of you looking to earn CPE credits, please ensure that you do answer the questions. That is a requirement for CPE credits. We do welcome your questions throughout the webinar. As mentioned, we'll answer as many as we can at the, towards the end of the webinar. But please do answer questions as they, as they arise. And lastly, the deck can be downloaded. A quick introduction. My name is Phil Antoon. I'm with the Alvarez and Marsal Valuation Services Practice. I've been practicing valuations for well in excess of 25 years. And I spend a majority of my time conducting valuations specifically for tax purposes. And my colleague, Darren Mills. Thanks, Phil. Um, again, thanks, everybody, for taking time out to, uh, to listen to us today. My name is Darren Mills. Um, I've got more than 20 years' experience. I'm uh, a CPA and an attorney in the state of New Jersey. Um, and uh, as most things in life, by happenstance, a couple years ago, I got involved in um, dealing with some foreign tax credits for a couple of clients, and that's what really got me involved uh, a lot more intensely, so to speak, with foreign tax credits. We are going to start off with a question, actually. And the question is, are you concerned that the fair market value election, if beneficial, would be overly burdensome to elect? And the responses are either yes, no, or not certain. And again, are you concerned that the fair market value election, if beneficial, would be overly burdensome to elect? And we're going to give everybody about 30 seconds to provide the responses. Thank you for all the responses. We just pushed out onto the, the webinar the answers. So it looks like about 40, almost 46% of the attendees think that the election would be overly burdensome. About 10% said no, and about 44% are not certain. So thank you for that feedback. And we're going to be uh, <clears throat> particularly just bear with me while I get the uh, slide to move forward here. Okay. 
There we go. <clears throat> we'll be particularly interested to see uh, how the results may turn out towards the end. If uh, we're actually going to ask the question again, <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to give a little bit of a brief background and why we think um, this is sort of an appropriate topic right now is that um, you know obviously we went through the Great Recession. Uh, we could probably still debate where we are economic-wise, but you know many taxpayers are starting to uh, burn through their net operating losses, and uh, cash taxes are becoming more and more important. Um, I have personally, right now, I'm actually helping a couple of clients uh, actually figure out whether or not they're in an overall foreign loss over, or an o overall domestic loss. Um, position with respect to foreign tax credit limitation um, because, you know, we as uh, humans tend to procrastinate and uh, we all know how much effort is involved in trying to get a tax return out the door. And so uh, a lot of times many companies weren't necessarily tracking that data um, and so now we're going back and looking at that. And, you know, so, you know, the other piece that becomes important is, you know, if a, if a uh, particularly in a public context, if, you know, uh, you had significant tax attributes related to a net operating loss and now you're getting ready to perhaps release your valuation allowance, um, your financial statement auditor may in fact ask uh, whether or not there's other assets that perhaps should be on the balance sheet like a foreign tax credit. So, um, again, we we are starting to see a number of clients uh, starting to wrestle with that issue, and so that's why we thought it was appropriate to talk about this um, topic at this point. But again, briefly, you know, the foreign tax credit is uh, designed to, you know, mitigate uh, sort of, uh, in a way, right, triple taxation. Uh, obviously, C corps are uh, subject to double taxation, pay tax based on the earnings they. Um, they have or taxable income they have, and then to the extent they make a dividend distribution to the shareholders, the shareholders are going to pay tax again. <clears throat> and so, um, if those, if the source of that dividend perhaps came from a foreign entity, um, if we didn't have the foreign tax credit, there could be potentially three layers of tax: one at the local level, uh, again at the U.S. Uh, C corp level, and then at the U.S. shareholder level. And so, from a policy standpoint. Um, also, not to let the foreign tax credit offset um, uh, you, the portion of your U.S. tax uh, that might be related to your U.S. source income. Um, the rules provide that uh, your limitation is essentially your net foreign source income over your worldwide taxable income times your U.S. tax, and that would be your foreign tax credit limitation as put forth in, in Section 904. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to uh, just keep in mind uh, for those of you that may not be overly familiar with the foreign tax credit itself is that it's generally hard for a taxpayer to generate foreign source income without incurring some kind of a residual U.S. tax. And the other thing I think that's interesting in this day and age is, as most of us know, and certainly there's um, it's a continued topic coming out of uh, coming out of DC is you know our corporate tax rate here in the US um, many countries all of our all of our major trading partners for that matter uh, have a corporate tax rate that's less than ours so <clears throat> um, to the extent the company uh, has earnings offshore you know like for example Ireland which has got a 12 and a half percent tax rate on their active trader business income if uh, you were to obviously bring your earnings back to the U.S., um, putting aside state and local impacts of that, uh, you're looking at potentially a 35% tax on that uh, with only a, a credit of 12.5%. So there would end up being some residual U.S. tax there. So one of the things we've been doing recently with, um, with a lot of our clients is focusing on the calculation itself and you know potential areas of opportunity um, that may help to increase the uh, net foreign source income. And <clears throat> again, you know 
um, as we all know, another issue that pops up and has certainly been in the papers is, and including uh, some companies having to go down to D.C., is you know the use of deferral structures um, along in conjunction with ABB 23, so that their effective tax rate is very low. Um, I looked at uh, General Electric's most recent 10K for 2014, and in their footnote to their uh, 10K, they disclosed that they have a 119 billion dollars of unremitted foreign earnings. Um, I was trying to check real quick what the cash balance is at Treasury, but um, I know uh, when I looked last year at a similar kind of thing, uh, Apple and GE and other major companies had more unremitted earnings than the U.S. had in cash. <clears throat> um, the other issue, issue, uh, important point that kind of comes up with this is that, um, again, going to the the decrease in the foreign tax rates along with the use of check the box. Uh, some taxpayers may have a, a super holding company structure whereby, you know, you got a company, uh, a holding company based in, let's just say, Luxembourg and a bunch of operating companies under it that might be checked, be disregarded. And so you end up having, uh, at the holding company level, a mixing of your your tax pools and your earnings and profits, and so obviously uh, any analysis as to whether or not to bring that money back to the U.S., um, you know, that's an important factor in that analysis. And so finally, um, the other point that sort of goes together with the structures a lot of taxpayers have is obviously, you know, going through the past couple years, uh, Congress was... Uh, permitting the acceleration of depreciation as a way to spur capital investment. And so a lot of taxpayers took advantage of bonus depreciation. And I'll explain in a minute why um, that potentially has an impact on the, uh, on the foreign tax credit. Darren, that's great background. Can you now talk to us a little bit about the, the current environment and where we are right now and what's really in this discussion. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> um, again, to, to kind of build upon where we want to hopefully get to from uh, from a uh, discussion point here on this on this webinar is again, it, given the interest rate environment, the Fed has you know, as we all know, kept interest rates very low over the past couple of years, and so many because it was almost lack of a better term, free money. Um, a lot of companies are going out and just leveraging up their balance sheets because it was so inexpensive to do so. Um, and so, you know, earlier I mentioned, uh, you know, it's difficult to generate net foreign source income without a residual U.S. tax. When I think about the foreign tax credit limitation and if you focus on deductions against your gross foreign source income, um, you know, I kind of say the big three, right, interest expense, R&D, and, and stewardship. And so here, obviously, we're going to focus on interest expense and um, what, you know, the, the regs under 861 require us to do is because, you know, money is considered to be fungible, we need to um, apportion the interest expense between our foreign source income and our U.S. source income. <clears throat> and uh, the one thing I always make sure people understand is that uh, you're looking effectively at big picture, page one of your 1120 if you're a corporate taxpayer. And so, you know, the, those that's the income that's getting included within your U.S. Uh, tax return, and that's what we're going to be looking at. If you can think, I wish I could draw, I always draw a pie. So if you draw a pie and you think, that that pie is your total worldwide taxable income on your U.S. tax return. You're going to bifurcate that pie into two slices, one being your your U.S. Uh, taxable income or loss, and the other being your your net foreign source income or loss. Um, <clears throat> another important matter with respect to interest expense is that your assets, uh, again, looking at your U.S. balance sheet, get characterized according to the source of the income they generate. Um, 
and within the regs you um, have to um, put those assets into three different buckets, your single category assets, multiple category assets, and assets that generate no yield. Um, by way of example, in the next bullet point, um, we also mentioned the physical location of the assets is not relevant. Uh, I don't know why I picked Tennessee, but I picked Tennessee. Uh, if you had a manufacturing plant in Tennessee that was generating um, 863B sales, um, you know, that plant, uh, for purposes of the interest expense apportionment, would, um, you know, have to be characterized as either foreign or U.S. Um, I'm going to jump to the, the next page. So um, one thing I didn't talk about yet is that effectively there's three methods under the 861 regs to um, apportion interest. There's the tax book value method, the alternative tax book value method, and the fair market value election, which we will spend most of the time talking about today. Um, the tax book value method is the default method under the regs. Um, book value essentially meaning your tax basis. So those of you that are certainly familiar with uh, ASC 740 and having to compute a tax basis balance sheet, that's essentially what you're looking at here. <clears throat> um, we kind of already talked about bonus depreciation and how that's impacting, um, you know, companies. The reason from a tax book value method, um, if your U.S. basis in your assets is getting depreciated more quickly than uh, the foreign side, then you're going to end up allocating more interest expense to foreign versus U.S., which, of course, is going to when you run through the math, is going to drive down your, your net foreign source income. Uh, therefore, your, your 904 limitation is going to be less. So again, the, the idea being um, the devil in the details, digging into the details to see how we might be able to, to increase the 904 limitation. <clears throat> um, kind of talked about how the impact of the depreciation uh, affects your tax basis balance sheet. The other thing under the tax book value method, the uh, last bullet point there, is that um, when, you're, when you're creating your tax basis balance sheet, the U.S. parent is obviously going to look out um, at its investments in its CFCs um, or CFC if it's got a holding company. Um, and in determining how that number impacts the apportionment of interest expense, you look at your outside basis in the stock of the CFC and it's generally increased by the earnings and profits. So earlier we talked about, um, you know, APB 23 and deferral structures. Um, you know, deferral structures are exactly what they are, right? You're, you're deferring the in income tax uh, impact, right? So you're kind of kicking the can down the road. <clears throat> the impact under the tax book value method is that the more foreign earnings and profits you accumulate, um, the bigger that number is going to be for purposes of the, the tax book value method. Therefore, the more interest expense is going to get allocated to, to foreign. And that's, that's the challenge there. Thanks, Gary. We're going to go on to our second question. It should pop up your, on the screen. The question is, is your company currently claiming a FTC? And the choices are yes, no, or not certain. Again, is your company currently claiming an FTC? And we'll give a, about 30 seconds for everybody to respond, and then we'll push out the results from there. Sure. And while you do that as well, I just noticed a question came in. Somebody was asking what NFSI stands for. Yes, it's Net Foreign Source Income. Um, that's back on the background page, I believe. Correct. Sorry, click the wrong button. Okay. okay. I may click that. We're just waiting for the final to come in. So we have the results. Is your company currently claiming an FTC? Yes, are 63%. No, are 26% and not certain are is about 11%. Thank you for the responses. 
So we're now going to talk about the fair market value method. Darren has outlined for everyone the, the background, where we are today, and now we start to venture into why one may want to consider making the fair market value election, and we'll start to go into a little bit more of the details after that. But Darren, if you could just talk sure. directly about purpose of making the fair market value election and, and the effect of making the election. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, again, unfortunately, we're trying to focus on one subject. We could spend hours and hours talking about the foreign tax credit in general um, and, the, and how you compete the limitation. But, <clears throat> you know, as, as we have here on the slide, really the, you know, the benefit of trying to make or, or not really make but analyze whether you should make the fair market value election is that, you know, we want to uh, be able to apportion the least amount of interest expense to our, against our gross foreign source income um, and more to our gross U.S. source income. Uh, therefore, we would increase our net foreign source income. <clears throat> um, as we just kind of talked about, the, the default method under the regs is the tax book value method, and that is done, again, generally using your tax basis and your assets, um, very akin to um, the same kind of analysis you do for ASC 740 purposes. And so, again, whether or not, and, and this you know, is where Phil can add, um, you know, hopefully, well, definitely will add a lot more color around, you know, whether or not making the election makes sense. But, um, again, the, one of the big drivers of trying to, uh, or looking at whether or not to make the election is um, to avoid sort of the skewing that may happen um, where your U.S. tax basis and your assets is getting driven down uh, perhaps by bonus depreciation, yet their value um, may be significantly greater than that. Um, and therefore, you end up with a distortion in the allocation of the interest. And again, bonus depreciation in the past a uh, couple of years would help, um, well, it doesn't help. I mean, it, it would be a contributor to that factor. Um, another point we just want to uh, note is that, uh, you know, as long as the statute of limitations is open, uh, you can generally go back and elect the fair market value method. Um, and one other final point, sort of paint the, uh, the, the parameters. Uh, and actually, let me just step back for a second. Also, as many of you know, making the election is generally a binding election, and you'd have to get permission from the commissioner to, to come off. Um, so that's one thing to obviously think about. But then, <clears throat> again, it, it is a global economy, um, although I think I read recently there was more inbound investment, or more public companies, uh, U.S.-based companies were making investments into the U.S. versus outside. But um, you know, it is a global economy, and so, uh, you know, multinationals will continue to make uh, investments outside the U.S. Uh, to grow their business, right? So um, we as tax practitioners, um, you know, have to help our clients and our, our you know, organizations help to mitigate, mitigate the tax impact of doing that. Um, so with that, Phil, I'm going to move on to the next slide here. So now we've talked about the, the background, the current environment. Darren just provided a, a foundation for the purpose of making the election and the effect of making the election. What I'm going to chat about in the next few slides is essentially how to, I'll, I'll say, pragmatically approach the potential of a fair market value election. What we don't want to do is, I always use the term, instead of diving in head first, what we would propose is a toe-in-the-water approach where you're taking a few preliminary steps to assess if the election would be beneficial. What we don't recommend is just going ahead and saying, I think I may have a benefit, I'm not certain of the level, and just plowing forward and doing a full analysis. We think a more prudent approach is to examine a few indicators conduct some higher level analyses up front, and that way you're arming yourself with information to essentially 
map out a range of potential savings if you were to make the election. That way you're, you're saving a lot of time, cost, and effort by doing some work on the front end. So the next few slides are all designed to, to demonstrate some of the approaches to take on the front end to make this, one, a less daunting process if you do make the election, and two, to, to enable you to make a well-informed decision as to if you should move forward or not. And I just want to make a couple of points here, Phil. Um, to the extent that uh, you've been claiming a deduction versus electing the credit, um, one of the points we have here, both points, is uh, we say is the company likely to be in an excess foreign credit position. Um, that would be the situation where you have enough foreign tax credit limitation um, versus that. Um, you don't have enough foreign tax credit uh, limitation to utilize all your credits. Um, what I just wanted to point out is if you've been deducting your taxes, um, but you could have been able to, if you had ended up in a situation where you could have excess limitation, um, just be careful of Section 905C. That may end up haircutting your credits. Um, and the other thing just to point out is that, um, you know, going back and looking at whether or not to deduct or credit your taxes, um, with respect to the 10-year statute, there's been a couple of chief counsel um, advices that have come out over the past couple of years, and one just recently as to whether or not uh, how the 10-year statute is applied to the credit versus the deduction. Um, so I just wanted to point those out. No, excellent points. The first step in the, in the process I'll go back. is, and some of these will look obvious, does the company have foreign operations? Is there a high level of interest expense? Are you in a taxable position in the U.S.? Darren just talked about excess foreign tax credits. If you look at these bullets, if you're, if you're going through these and saying, I have most of these, then you want to take a step back and say, okay, let me move to the next step of, of a diagnostic. If you're looking at these saying, I don't really have these, then your, your question's answered right there. But let's go under the assumption that you have these characteristics. And again, these are early indicators. Now we take the second step and say, what are the indicators of potential benefit? And the first bullet is always, for me, the key because when we talk about really what drives the value and what drives the effort and the complexity, and I think what scares most people off tends to be the effort required around the valuation of the tangible assets. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch upon that throughout this process. But that's the first, the, the, the first indicator is, is the fair market value of your U.S. tangible assets as a percentage of total company tangible assets greater than your tax basis? So if you have that characteristic, then it's, there's a pretty good chance that you want to move forward to your next step. So again, this is your first toe in the water to make certain that your company is in a position where they could potentially benefit from the fair market value election. So now we've moved to the, ne to the next step. And again, I don't think personally that we're ready to say let's dive in head first and do a full-blown fair market value election. There is another step in between. And I call it a, a diagnostic analysis. And what I, what I want to stress here is to put it in perspective. This one is not your full-blown fair market value election. So let's Put that to one end of the spectrum. On the other hand, this is not some, what I'll call, what we like to call in valuation, a back of the envelope calculation. This is more refined than a back of the envelope and, and obviously nowhere near the level of effort for a full blown analysis. So the, just so I can level set the expectations on this step, it's doing enough work that you're comfortable with deriving a range of value, for example, for your fixed assets, a range of potential benefits. This is where you're going to be able to make your informed decision. We're, uh, we're not big proponents of the back of the envelope approach because, 
quite often or too often, you don't have enough data points on that approach to really make it a meaningful analysis. And I think Darren and I have both seen in, in past history times where someone's tried to implement a back of the envelope. By the time you get done, so the back of the envelope said, I think I'm going to have a benefit of X dollars. They moved and went and did a full-blown analysis, and by the time they got finished, that benefit was nowhere near what they expected on the back of the envelope. Right. And I know Darren said he's unfortunately witnessed a couple of these. <laughs> so, so we need to be, we want to be very cautious in this diagnostic in that we don't want to do something where it's just not supportable. So what do we do? It, we move forward with this prudent approach. The end of the day, we're not looking to get the exact number. We're looking to get a reasonable range of savings, and that way we'll know when we do a full analysis that we're going to fall somewhere within that range. And I'm going to focus on the second bullet, perform a high-level estimate of the fair market value of the company's domestic versus international assets. And, and really, in, in a in the next slide as we move to that, I'm going to talk about some approaches we use to do that. The, the reason that I'm pointing out the fixed assets and that I'm going to focus on the fixed assets throughout this discussion is that if you take a step back and look at a fair market value election, at the end of the day, most of this is actually more of a mechanical calculation. We're going to walk you through six steps. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the detail because those six steps are, in fact, very mechanical. The one exception to that, and again, to reiterate, the area that causes most headaches for people, both from an effort point of view and a time point of view, are the fixed assets. And we go on to the next slide. So now we've got our diagnostic set up, and we know we want to move forward with this. What do we actually do? And I outlined a few bullet points in here that talk about some of the steps. It's the second bullet point where I really want to highlight. What have I seen in the past? I, I, I've noticed some companies, and I'm going to my back of the envelope. They've taken um, the tax basis of the fixed assets and applied some step-up percentage. They've taken the net book value of the fixed assets and applied some step-up. They've used the original cost. They've used the net book value. I, I, I've seen a number of variations on the back of the envelope, none of which really are going to get you to a reasonable fair market value in most cases. So when I, if I can point out what not to do on the diagnostic, it's simply to take the net book value or simply to take the tax basis or simply to take the original cost or even a replacement cost. How much would the assets cost new today? Uh, I've seen people take insurable value reports where they have a replacement cost for insurance purposes and use those values as a back of the envelope. Those are all things we do not want to do. What do we want to do? I, there are two, two approaches that I like to take. One is what I call, it's more of a, a higher level trend analysis, and I'll caution that this is not going to be something that you would rely on for your full analysis if you make the election. What this does is it takes the fixed asset records and through some high-level analyses allows us to start to frame out a range of value. It takes into consideration um, your actual books and records. It takes into consideration the original cost of the assets, when they were placed in service. Um, we'll do some simulations in terms of the depreciation factors. What we're coming up with essentially is a replacement cost, an estimate of depreciation, and what we're left with is an estimated fair market value. This approach is, is, a, is a good approach for a diagnostic when you have a centralized fixed asset ledger. So when you have the assets of all of your entities worldwide loaded into one system, it's in one readily available download. This, when that's the case, which is quite often not the case, this is a good candidate to do that trend analysis. 
and you would sensitivity and, and essentially do a sensitivity and stress test your assumptions to frame out a range of reasonable values. In other cases, I've used um, really more of a sampling technique where maybe you, maybe you look at a, a few of your larger facilities and you start to categorize your facilities into buckets. And what you can do is a, a little bit more detailed evaluation of one of your facilities within each bucket and apply the metrics of that sample out to your other facilities. Again, these are two approaches that I like to implement, and there's no, um, no magic bullet here. It all tends to be very facts and circumstances. The best approach is to understand the condition and availability of your data and work backwards from there as to what would be the best approach to, to use from there. Again, this is going to give you a more refined answer than a back of the envelope and I, I will stress, it is not going to give you that analysis that you will need to conduct to provide full support for the fair market value election. And another point I would add, is what I have done, um, and, I, and I'm sure other firms as well, is uh, you know, some of the data that somebody like Phil will get from doing diagnostic, you can put it into a model and see if it will move the needle, so to speak, with respect to the apportionment of interest. Uh, again, just helping solidify the decision as to whether or not it makes sense to move forward with the election or not. And we're going to now go on and on the next slide, this is titled Valuation Guidance. You could also title this Pitfalls to Avoid um, What what to do, what not to do. This is really a summary of some key factors around the fair market value election specific to the valuation. And again, the reason that I'm highlighting this is, as mentioned previously, this is largely a mechanical calculation for the most part with the exception of the valuation of these assets. Thus, we really want to point out the, the areas to focus on, and, and some of these are just pulled from things that we uh, have observed over the years. And I'll point out a few that I've seen more often than not. The third bullet, book value does not equate to fair market value and cannot be used as replacement for fair market value. Darren's chuckling because I cannot tell you how many times this has actually been implemented, where the fair market value election was, was selected and the net book value of assets was then utilized as part of the analysis. You're definitely playing with fire because the, the IRS can throw you off of uh, the fair market value method. The next bullet, acquisition cost data, not an acceptable proxy for fair market value and failure to adjust the price is unacceptable. I've seen, I mentioned before an example where I saw replacement cost, which is basically how much would the asset cost to replace new today. I, I have witnessed that being utilized as a proxy for fair market value. The problem is that's not fair market value because the assets that you have are in place and have some age to them. They have some depreciation. They have physical obsolescence to them. Capturing just a replacement cost is not going to account for the depreciation, and therefore the replacement cost will not be a reasonable approach to estimating fair market value. The, the, the next bullet, use of inconsistent methods for foreign assets and U.S. assets is, is unacceptable. Again, I, I have seen one valuation approach taken for the U.S. assets and a second taken for the foreign assets. That is a no-no. This is something where you want to make certain that you're uniformly applying your methodologies. We are now going to jump to another question. Is your company in an excess limitation or excess credit position? And the choices are yes, no, or not certain. Again, is your company in an excess limitation 
or credit position. We'll give about 30 seconds. And as we wait for the question to, for the uh, responses to come in, we're getting a lot of questions, which is very good. We're going to ensure that we that we carve out some time at the end to answer the questions, as many as possible. And again, for any questions we do not get to, we will respond to you personally with answers to those questions um, after the webinar. And the results of the poll, we have 45%. Yes, we have 26% no and 28% not certain. Sorry about that. Here we go. <clears throat> Apologize yep. for the technical glitch on the clicks there. Darren's going to lead us into the six steps of the fair market value election. Again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on each of the steps. We are going to focus primarily on actual implementation of the process for the fixed asset valuation because, again, that is the area that tends to cause people most of the concern. So, Darren? Great. Thanks. I, I think, um, as Phil said earlier, um, the, uh, the regs under the fair market value election with respect to determining um, the asset values that will be used for apportioning the interest um, are very mechanical in nature, except for obviously the valuation piece, um, yeah. which you know is going to entail um, some, you know a, a significant level of professional subjectivity based on objective data. <clears throat> um, so. It, you know, again, the, the six slides are sort of, or I'm sorry, the six steps are, are in the slides here. Um, so we don't want to go into too much detail. The one thing I will note, in case you're not a publicly traded company, in a publicly traded company, you can obviously pull the stock price off of um, whatever exchange you may be on um, and, you know, use that as the starting point to help figuring out what the overall value is. Uh, if you're a public, uh, pardon me. If you're a private entity, um, generally it's a capitalization of corporate earnings um, to determine the aggregate value of all your assets. And there's a Rev Rule 68-609 that provides guidance for folks like Phil to um, kind of help figure that out. So, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on on the six steps, but the um, I think the most important step is, at least with respect to what we're trying to talk about today, is, is the next slide here, which is on the, uh, the valuation of tangible assets. Thanks, Darren. So it, this is really just a, a, a lead-in from the prior discussion about handling the fixed assets. So we've done our high-level analysis. Now we have to go in and we have to value the assets at, at all the locations. And, and I know this is really what provides uh, the most headaches for people. Uh, I put some bullets down here just to outline the different situations that will allow you to dictate what direction to go into. And I'm going to also make a few points here around this. So at, at a higher level, the, the first comment I'll make is we talked about doing a high level diagnostic and a trend valuation on the diagnostic step. Now you're making the full election. You have to conduct site visits. And the question I always get is, I have 40 locations around the world. I don't want to take this on because I, I, no one's going to be able to visit all 40 locations. And what I say is, what, we, what you can do is take a few locations, one, three, four, five, whatever the number may be, and you visit a few locations each year. The next year when you go to do the analysis, you visit another few locations. So what you're doing is you're, you're reducing the burden by not trying to run around to every single location. You are going to visit certain locations. And as you start to rotate that, you'll find that, you're, that you are hitting the location. So at some point in time, you're going to pay a visit to all of your major locations. But it's an important point, 
and, and one in which I'll differentiate between financial reporting. Because if anyone's had involvement with financial reporting valuations, quite often valuations for fixed assets are conducted more on a desktop approach where someone is not going to look at the site and they're just using trend factors. For this valuation, really what one needs to do is, and again, this is a differentiation from financial reporting, is you have to conduct the site visits. You have to use multiple approaches to valuation. Yes, you're going to rely on the fixed asset records without a doubt. And yes, you're going to apply some pricing figures. But you also need to look at a market approach where you're looking at how much does this asset cost new? Is there a used market for this asset? You really have to go to another level of, of detail when valuing the fixed assets relative to what one would do for a financial reporting valuation. The how do you know if you're going to have a tough time with it or if it's going to be a smoother exercise? As I mentioned previously, sometimes you find that your fixed asset records are in a central location. If that is the case, you are, I don't want to say you're going to have smooth sailing, but it makes life much, much easier. Because now you or if you have an outside expert assisting, can work off of that one ledger. They can do all the valuation in that ledger. It's in the same format. It's in the same currency. It's a much easier process. So I will tell you that as a, as a first flag, if you have a centralized fixed asset ledger for your global operations, it is, it's going to be a much less daunting task than what you envisioned previously. If, in fact, you do not have that, and it's very common that ledgers are available only on a local basis, at that point, it's still not a daunting task. It's, it's going to be more difficult than if you had a centralized ledger. The key here in this situation, and we deal with this with, with a number of our clients, is organization up front. Spend some additional time up front to, to essentially send a nice email out for those responsible for the fixed asset ledgers in each location. They send a nice email out to everyone, explain what you're doing. They will provide back the ledgers. Once you get through that initial phase, and the key here is prepping everybody to what you're doing, why you're doing it. People are much more open to, to responding quickly and sending the ledgers through. Once you have that done, that process becomes much more streamlined as you go through and do your updates each year because you went through it the first time. So for me, even in that, and I'm going to call it your worst case scenario, even in your worst case scenario where you have ledgers coming from all over the world in different forms and in different currencies, it's still a very, what I'll call, doable process. It's all a function of ensuring that you have an organized process prior to, to jumping into it. And, and to me, that's the key with making this a feasible and streamlined process. It's really in, in, in this slide right here is going in and understanding what you have and, and how to work with that. And again, I think the message here from us is even if you do have ledgers at locations worldwide and there are different forms, this is still a process that can be conducted very efficiently. The other point I wanted to make, and in addition to that, it was, I made the one point about the difference from financial reporting because I, I have seen people try to apply financial reporting evaluations and you don't have the level of documentation you need, is that you have to be cognizant of any other valuations you've conducted. For example, if you had a transaction where you transferred uh, fixed assets from one entity to another and it was a taxable transaction and you valued those fixed assets, you want to be cognizant of that to ensure in your fair market value election analysis that you are not applying a different value to those assets for your fair market value election. And that's a key point that, again, is, is part of your planning process up front. Make a list of any other valuation that you've, had, that you've conducted and let's ensure that we have complete consistency with those, with those valuations. So that's it for the, for the fixed assets. Again, uh, this is really the only of the six steps where we want to spend 
some time. The rest are mechanical. We're going to page through very quickly so you can look at those. But again, I think this slide here, if there's one slide you want to hone in on and, and really get a feel for the process, this would be it. Okay. Um, so real quick, um, and, and I think this hopefully the step three here, one thing I didn't mention earlier, but just, and it's put here in the bullet point, but again, the, the regs under the fair market value election, putting aside the valuation issue of the tangible assets is very, you know, mechanical, formulistic in nature. So essentially, once you figure out what your total overall value is, and then somebody like Phil figures out what the um, value of the tangible assets are, all you're really doing is solving for the, in, the intangible value, which is simply going to be, you know, the total value less the tangible value. And um, again, that's just sort of an important concept to keep in mind with respect to um, this election. The other point uh, I want to make is with respect to step four and the portion of the intangible assets. <clears throat> um, generally, it's a portion between your U.S. and your foreign entities based upon the net income of the group, right? So you're going to start looking at uh, your, your net income of your, your CFCs, for example. Um, that may not necessarily correlate with where value is being created. So you may get, uh, again, because it's a mechanical exercise, you may get an, an answer that may be different than what you expected or where value may, you may think value sits. Again, it also goes back to um, why using a back of the envelope analysis could be a little, little problematic. <clears throat> um, move forward here. Because we, uh, we are getting close on time. We do have a number of questions we'd like to try and address as well. Um, just uh, the last point, actually the last point I'm going to make, I think, on these six steps is with respect to step six. Um, regs were finalized last uh, summer uh, dealing with related party debt um, and how that's treated in the analysis to determine the, um, in particular, the value of your, your, the stock of your CFC. <clears throat> um, I have personally seen uh, models that um, you know a, a taxpayer was using, and they weren't updated for this rule. So that could have um, you know could have certainly an impact on the analysis. Um, and we're going to switch over to a documentation slide, and we're not going to really spend much time on this. This is really something that if anybody wants to take a look at uh, offline. What we tried to do here is just provide an, an outline for the type of documentation that you will need as part of the fair market value election. Okay. Questions will pop up on your screen in a second. Should there? Right. And you may be familiar with this question because we asked it in the beginning. Now, as a result of listening to this webinar, are you concerned that the fair market value election, if beneficial, would be overly burdensome to elect? Yes, no, or not certain. And we'll give 30 seconds for everybody to respond. And once that occurs, Darren and I will give a few quick takeaways, and then we'll save a few minutes to answer questions. Okay, so the results as you see now are, it's about the same for the yeses, and the noes are 28% and the not certains are about 26%. So uh, a lot of the not certains are, have moved into the no category, which is, which is good to hear. A few quick takeaways. We have about four minutes here. Darren, you want to? Do the honors. Sure. Um, as we noted in, in the beginning, particularly in the background, um, you know, the, the tax book value method 
um, can result in sort of a skewed, uh, um, well, again, can result in a skewed answer because of bonus depreciation, um, potentially deferral of your foreign earnings, um, and again, bonus depreciation relative to the value of your U.S. assets. <clears throat> um, again, the big three interest expense I have seen personally tends to be the um, largest uh, expense that gets apportioned against your gross foreign source income. And so, uh, you know, it's definitely an item to, uh, to scrub to see if uh, you're able to move the needle at all uh, to portion less interest expense against the uh, foreign and more against the U.S. <clears throat> um, we kind of touched about this was, was really what Phil was getting at. You know, the election itself doesn't have to be daunting or, or overwhelming. Um, you know, if you take an organized approach, it can uh, be streamlined. And, and, you know, like any business decision, there's got to be a cost-benefit to it, right? So the benefit's got to be, um, you know, big enough to, to make the election. <clears throat> and again, it can, the election can be open, uh, made for any uh, open years. Um, two points, because I think we saw this question a couple times. One, it is generally a binding election. If you make it, you got to go uh, get the permission of the service to come off of it. Um, it's not an annual election. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be, you know, <laughs> be taxpayer favorable, probably, for sure. Uh, you pick and choose, but um, it, it is a uh, generally a binding election. And um, I saw another question I thought was very interesting: how the, the this election may interact with uh, whether or not you have an over, overall foreign loss or an overall domestic loss. For sure, if you are going back and, again, during, you know, sort of your open years, um, looking at whether or not to make this election, um, to the extent it moves the needle and um, lowers your overall foreign loss or potentially helps to increase your overall domestic loss, because remember, OFL is generally, uh, you know, bad and, and ODL is generally your friend, um, you know, it's certainly worth looking at. And Phil, um, okay. I we do have a few more questions that are coming in, but we're just about out of time here. So what we're going to do for those of you who um, who submitted questions, but we haven't been able to get to those yet. We will answer those for you offline. Again, we want to thank everyone for joining the webinar today. We hope that you found it informative and helpful. And if you do have any follow-up questions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask it. And we hope everybody has a, a good rest of the day. Thank yes. you. Thank you.